Hi EXers, welcome to the EX Podcast episode number 28. This is your host, Stefan Vincent. I started this podcast because I believe that companies have to think of themselves as employment brands if they hope to attract and retain talent. This podcast brings a different lens to the employee experience, a brand and customer experience perspective rather than a traditional HR perspective. Our guests, all thought leaders and disruptors in the EX space in their own way, come to this show to debate, discuss and share best practices on the key components that foster employee engagement and strengthen company culture, and also to spark the conversation on how to create positive employee experiences. One size doesn't fit all. What Airbnb or Google do around the employee experience may not be applicable in a smaller company. This is what this show is all about, sharing stories of companies of all sizes, not only to show that EX doesn't require a large budget or a large team, but also that there isn't one recipe. Each company can find its own way through the EX journey. Today's guest is Rahila Enwar, speaking with me from Chicago. Rahila is the Chief of Sales, Client Solutions, and North American Market Strategy at the BPI Group. BPI, headquartered in Paris, in France, is a global management and HR consulting firm, helping people and organizations navigate the future of work. Today with Rahila, we will talk about voluntarily versus involuntarily transitions, the importance of transparency in the workplace, how to build a strategy for gender quality in an organization, the place of women in the workplace, the opportunities and challenges they're facing, and how the public perception of a customer brand has an impact on a recruiting. This week's EX podcast is sponsored by Structural. Structural unleashes the potential of people and teams by giving organizations real-time mobile access to employee data. Find, engage, and retain talent with the Structural Employee Success Platform. EX Podcast listeners can visit structural.com slash EX Podcast to get access to the latest employee experience resources, including the Employee Success Playbook, featuring 10 research-backed methods to improve business outcomes. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Rahila. If you get a chance, please make sure to review the podcast on iTunes. You can open the iTunes app and type in Stefan Vincent or EX Podcast, and you will find us there. And last thing, if you want to send me feedback, suggestions for future topics or guests, you can reach me at svincent at exsummit.com or on Twitter at ex underscore summit. Thanks for your support and your loyalty. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the EX Podcast. Today's guest is Rahila Anwar. Rahila is the Chief of Sales, Client Solutions, and North American Market Strategy at the BPI Group. BPI Group is a global management and HR consulting firm helping people and organizations navigate the future of work. Rahila calls Chicago home, but BPI is headquartered in Paris, France. Rahila, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Stefan. So for those who don't know you, tell us a bit more about BPI, its global reach, how many people you have working for the company, and your background and your current role at BPI. Sure. So, Stefan, we really define ourselves as being um, the global leadership, talent, and transition experts. Um, and we believe that via our work um, with the teams that we have globally, we really transform the people we work with and the organizations um, in truly an extraordinary way. That would be, I would say, the short version. But what we're really doing is working with 
individuals um, in terms of executive coaching um, teams, many of them high potential um, via our leadership and talent um, practice, and then helping organizations as they transition um, individuals both involuntarily um, as well as through um, normal attrition where individuals are offered support in leaving the organization or looking at opportunities within the organization. In my background, and you and I have discussed this before, is I was a financial services executive. I went through um, from the beginning of my career um, through my early 40s, um, doing a lot of banking work as well as um, investment work and strategy work and building and and leading teams um, in that vertical. Um, I transitioned to the uh, people or human capital space five and a half years ago and working with primarily large companies in voluntary and involuntary transition, um, specializing really in corporate delayerings um, and helping those people be successful and really see the possibilities of their careers, let's call it professional engagement, at new organizations. Um, In my current role at BPI, what I do is the common theme is help organizations and individuals be successful, but it's introducing our um, array of talent um, strategies and leadership strategies and transition strategies to both companies that are um, aware of our capabilities, maybe in one vertical, or broadly aren't aware of our um, work. And then I lead the sales um, team. The client solutions team um, is globally about um, 400 people across all of the countries. Um, So we have a large network of global partners um, And then in terms of our strategy of growing in various markets, it's primarily North American growth at this point. All right. When we spoke a few days ago, we we talked about, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, voluntarily versus uh, involuntarily a transition. Could you expand a bit more on what it is? And we also talked about the, the parallel between transitions on the customer side and transitions on the employee side and what are the similarities and maybe some of the differences as well? Absolutely. So the the definition is how um, the change happens um, in the individual's um, choice to either stay or leave. And I would argue that every single um, individual who's a professional is making this choice daily Uh, by coming to work, engaging, um, and choosing to do the highest quality work that they can, or potentially considering other alternatives, um, either within the company or comparing it to outside opportunities. The difference is is that when the choice is made for you, um, you are not choosing the timing. You may or may not be aware of of, there's no transparency around when you're going to land. And so there's definitely a, a significant difference in how people view it emotionally. But I re- would say that you know the parallel between a customer experience is customers are making choices every day about who they engage with. And so when an organization um, treats its employees as being um, ones that have options, and can choose other organizations, it's the parallel um, between how their customers um, are also viewing them. And what are, what are the, the obstacles that companies may face when they actually try to address this uh, transition challenge? Sure. So most companies do a really good job of selling Um, external uh, potential hires. They um, put a lot of effort into the interview process, um, and it may start as early as 
you know, on a college campus where an organization is um, putting resources into attracting, you know, young people um, into their first jobs. And then they may use a search firm, and the search firm um, does a good job of you know, telling the story. Where the employee experience seems to um, deteriorate a bit is with existing employees and the idea um, of engaging those people in the same way that you would when you're trying to get them to join the organization. And in this day and age, with the portability of skills, um, with transparency, like with um, Glassdoor, let's use as an example, um, social media um, postings, employees that have the option um, to look externally are more likely in today's environment to do so than at any other time in the past. And when you look at nationwide employment rate or unemployment rates, that are less than 5%. And you're really looking at almost a full employment economy. Mm -hmm. And the organizations that are treating their employees as um, truly valued, um, if they are the true ones that they want to keep, Mm. are really going to be the winners um, in in what I would call the talent war. And that's been overplayed um, in terms of a tagline. I would call it um, the talent competition um, and more like the Olympics of talent rather than it being a war. Yes, and there's there's an expectation from individuals around transparency, whether it's it's from a, a consumer brand, it's from an employer brand, a social responsibility. Uh, so how do you companies address those expectations when it comes to transparency. Many companies may not be as willing to provide full transparency on the recruiting process, who they recruit versus who they don't recruit for whatever reasons. Uh, Even once people join the company, it may not be completely transparent about career paths or promotions what would you suggest for companies to embrace these uh, transparency expectations from individuals? So, so we discussed this, that there is a wide, wide range of transparency from almost none um, to complete succession planning um, grids that are laid out um, where individuals know exactly where they stand Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of leadership transition. I actually think that it, it's much broader than that, especially in invi- in an environment that we're in now, which organizations are much flatter. The idea of recognition and reward isn't always promotion um, necessarily. It can be um, different experiences. And we're going to talk about the experience of women specifically in a little bit. But I would say that the ability of an organization Um, to be able to offer to all individuals that work for them um, a roadmap that the employee controls and that the employee is in charge of um, in terms of their own career management is going to be much more successful than the organization that's telling people what to do or spoon feeding them. Um, And when you look at under really the generation under 30 um, the portability of their skill set and their ability to move. The average um, millennial um, is not um, about 5% or less. Um, there's been studies done, and we'll say that they are going to stay at the same organization for their entire career. So for them, if skill gathering is important, broadening their employee experience by giving them different skills you're more likely to keep a high potential or a high performer. Um, Those are two different things. Um, If you do that, if you offer them um, these opportunities. And when the opportunities aren't visible, individuals begin to feel that the, the company has something to hide. And the best organizations are truly offering these team based um, or individual projects much more broadly than to just the leadership group. It's a good point about uh, expectations from 
millennials and even general in general terms, people joining a company. I was speaking with uh, Matt Morgan from a startup in San Francisco called Blends, and he was saying that in uh, in his company Blends, they have full transparency about. They understand that candidates who join the company are not going to stay there forever. What they really want to provide is provide an, an environment for those new employees to grow professionally and personally during their stay within the company. But it's okay on both sides if they decide to, uh, to split at some point and go in different directions. But they really want to provide an environment where those people can grow for the time they actually work for the company. And not many companies have that sort of a mindset where, you know, if we hire you, we expect you to stay for a long, long time because we're going to invest on you and we want some return on investment for over a long period of time. Stefan, that's a great point, and the lens that I would offer you is there are um, verticals that are doing it really well. I would say a lot of the professional services firms um, that have natural attrition, um, especially in the consulting space, are doing a really good job. They understand that um, the individuals that leave um, may become their clients someday, um, their representatives of their um, brand um, once they go to companies, um, especially where they would transition to, let's say, a CPG company or a pharma company after doing consulting. And so they help those individuals at different levels um, leave in an orderly way and feel good about their transition. And last week, I spoke um, on a panel at Kellogg, which is Northwestern's um, Graduate School of Business, and it was in the organization and behaviors class mostly, um, it was about 90% um, second year students. And a lot of the questions were around um, culture and they're making decisions right now about where they are going. So these are highly sought after uh, business school graduates and their first lens is around what their experience will look at mm -hmm. and second, what the relationship with other employees is. Um, at the company. And, and I think that that represents a significant shift versus a decade ago um, when I was an advisor um, to the asset management uh, practice there, in which most of it was around financial reward and around promotion um, as being the lens of what um, these students were choosing. It's a very um, marked shift in the evaluation criteria. I, I agree with you. You are a big advocate on the role of women in the workplace. And I am. We, we're going to spend a few minutes on this topic because it is a fascinating topic, um, in my opinion. I'm sure that a lot of our female and probably even some uh, of our male listeners will, will relate to this. How do, you, how do women view transitions broadly across industries and what does it mean as a female employee? So I think that this is where there's a um, significant difference between um, varying generations of women um, in terms of the view of transition. And again, we've discussed how both voluntary and involuntary looks different. I think as women look at organizations that they are choosing um, to work at, they generally have found a way um, to provide, and, I, and the word balance is overused, but have um, found a way to find harmony between um, their work and life. Late, earlier this week, um, I spoke to a group um, and it's women who have young children. So this group of about 100 um, women, they call it Big Career Little Kids, a vibrant group here in Chicago. And I was addressing the group on um, what I believe the landscape looks like right now. I truly believe, I really um, am passionate about this, there's never been a better time for women in the workforce both in individual contributor or leadership roles um, because the use of technology 
um, the low um, unemployment rate, and this concept that we've talked about around transparency of culture um, because of social media is making it much better for women to be able to um, have a view from the outside of what an organization um, will feel like once they're part of it. The part that's kind of interesting to me is um, you've probably seen the same data that I have that if there's, let's say, about 10 criteria for a role, on average, a woman um, believes she has to have um, somewhere between seven and eight of them before she'll even apply. And on average, um, a man um, would uh, believe that he would have to have between two and three of them before he'll apply. So that's a substantial difference it is. in self-awareness um, or self-perception. And so it, it's, it, it informs a way in which a woman will look at her opportunity set. Um, and it's what we do in terms of coaching to kind of level the playing field um, on that. Now, even though it's, it's a great time for women to be able to transition uh, from one role or from one company to another, as you uh, stated uh, a few minutes ago, there's still a big, a big gap in gender equality in the workplace. Right? You don't have as many women as men in leadership roles in many, many organizations and industries. And even though when you have comparable roles between a woman and a man, even the pay is not the same. Yes. So I won't go into, I could um, speak basically for an hour <laughs> about statistics, but that would be very boring to everyone. So let's just start with um, that is absolutely an accurate reflection of the current landscape of leadership um, percentages. If you look at McKinsey data, it just came out. If you look at the Catalyst organization, which has done extremely high quality work, um, around um, this space, you will see that the percentage of women entering the workforce and into individual contributor roles currently versus the percentage that are in leadership roles um, is um, less than half of their male counterparts in the leadership role. It's actually um, less than 25% in what we call L1 roles, so that C-suite direct reports, and especially around um, women leading parts of the organization that have PL responsibility rather than be in more traditional staff roles um, like legal or finance. So why am I so confident that this is changing? Um, because um, there are companies, so we have worked with an organization that looked at their employee engagement results and where there were uh, more than 15 to 20 basis points difference between um, the women's perception at the company and the men's perception. The company is putting in place um, certain activities, trainings, exposure um, projects, and working with us in structuring that so that they can close that gap um, between the perception, um, that's internal perception, um, that their employees have the difference between women and men. I would also say that as you look at the career trajectory of women that are entering the workforce now, because of the few things I mentioned, I do believe that they are going to ask for something different. Most women, we look at studies, ask for compensation as what they are asking for in terms of when they go to their leader. And the reality is, is that what women need to be asking for is more um, involvement in innovation, more um, highly visible projects to lead, um, either restructures or various other high impact projects and acquisition related um, endeavor. Because that's what gets you um, into the mix of growth conversations at your company. And so helping women understand what they can do earlier in their careers 
to get exposure to um, these high valued pro- high value added projects rather than just asking for compensation is what is going to drive their ability to be identified as leaders um, at the next level and then the following level after that. So um, I think you and I have discussed a lot that from the outside, you don't have as much, um, let's call it, um, information beyond what you can gather you know, anecdotally. But once you're inside, there's a lot more you can do to manage your career. Right. Let's let's go through a through a scenario, and you can either answer from your own perspective or from what you've witnessed working uh, with different organizations. As a female employee, if you had the choice to go work for a company that had a highest EX employee experience rating from female employees, but with a lower overall EX rating. Or if you go to if you had the choice to go to work for a company that had a higher overall EX rating but a lower uh, among a lower rate among among women, which one would you choose? So this is um, complicated. The it um, is. I'm a data person, of course, I'm going to ask you um, how substantive is the difference, um, and I think that enough people in the media and on social media have beat up on um, Uber. So I'm not going to use that as an example. I'd, I'd rather use um, a positive example, um, and I, I'll get to one. So th- the question is, how big is the difference? That's number one. Yes. And number two, I think it really depends on where you are um, in your career. So as a senior leader, um, I, for the first time since June, um, am working for um, a woman CEO, and I'm ecstatic. Um, Until this point, um, I have never um, worked as a senior leader for um, another woman, and um, the person who I work for has encouraged and developed women for, you know, 20 years, so it's not like... And this is new um, to her. I think young when you're younger and you need um, perhaps flexibility, perhaps um, a different level of communication, maybe you need a more formal or informal mentoring. If the organization that you are um, choosing to go to has substantially higher um, ratings for women than overall, I think that you'd be uh, much more likely to go to that organization because something is going well for women there, and there are things that you may need um, as either um, a woman employee or a woman leader earlier in your career that you may not need later on as much of. Does that help answer your question, Stefan? Yes, yes. And, and it's, it's a tough one because obviously it depends on each individual as well and what their preferences are. But when we talk about gender equality and developing opportunities for uh, women in the workplace, what kind of advice would you give organizations to put together a strategy, a strategy and a plan to really develop those opportunities for female workers to be able to manage their careers, not only just um, laterally, but going up the ladder as well? Sure. So fundamentally, my point of view is always one of complete meritocracy. So I'm not going to be um, the person who says um, uh, women should have, um, you know, a substantial um, advantage or there needs to be very um, specific things, you know, always done for women. I will say that for me, I believe that there are two programs that work no matter where, um, what size of organization, where you are at the company, and that is uh, mentoring, both cross-functionally, women mentoring women, um, men mentoring women. You can't rely on single um, subset mentoring. So, for example, Um, At the organization that I was at um, for many years, we started um, an Asian American um, leadership group um, to mentor um, individuals at the company. 
Well, there weren't enough Asian American leaders to be able to do that. So we pulled in um, a variety of different people um, to help with that and to raise the the visibility of um, this high potential talent pool. Um, And it was highly effective. In fact, it's still um, in its existence, you know, 12, 15 years later. But the way in which mentoring helps open the dialogue um, with the organizational leaders and then women who need one-on-one conversation, potentially around perception, uh, potentially around, um, we've discussed communication that may be different. That is the the single, um, uh, I call it the secret sauce um, in terms of changing engagement results. Now it has to be structured, it has to be well um, developed, and sometimes companies just don't have the bandwidth to be able to implement but even starting small can have um, a significant impact. Um, The second is employee surveys. There is no substitute for having um, regular engagement result um, survey work um, because it is a um, just fantastic way to get anonymous feedback um, on what the perception is um, and making incremental positive change. Or potentially even... Um, deterioration. Maybe there's been, um, again, a delayering or people feel um, negatively, but it's important to know that more than anecdotally. Let's talk further on on the survey. In in your experience, is there an ideal rhythm of surveys? Should it be once a quarter, once a month, every week, once a year? And also, I've, I've read research and even uh, Jacob Morgan in his book, uh, The uh, Employee Experience Adva- Advantage, talks about CEOs and CHROs mentioning that they can somehow skew the surveys uh, depending on you know, how they formulate the questions or even what, what day, what time of the week or the day they would send surveys if they're looking for more optimistic or positive answers versus negative answers. So let's go first about, is there a specific rhythm or a better rhythm when it comes to sending surveys? And then the second question is, how can you articulate a survey so that it's it's not uh, skewed in one way or another? So I follow um, and I'm a huge fan um, of Jacob's um, work. And I believe that if if the company wants to skew any result, um, they potentially can, while, of course, being truthful right, and right. accurate and ethical. That's, I would never um, assume that a company isn't doing that. But um, the way in which employee engagement results are um, rolled out or disclosed I think is a um, significant um, part of the employee experience. Um, but the direct answer to your question is, I think a minimum of once a year um, for an engagement um, survey, even if it's a pulse check and then a more complete survey um, every 24 months, I think that that is what um, is absolutely necessary. Um, more than that, you might not see um, shifts as much. Um, and less than that, you're just losing an entire group um, of employees. I also think that exit surveys um, are very valuable um, in addition. If they're done right, yes. Yeah. And, and if, they, if the data is used, um, not just the quantitative, but the qualitative um, data, um, is used. So, but in terms of the way in which um, employees or employers can skew um, the results, I think that is a um, a dark place to um, to come from. If I would argue that most employers um, are not looking at it with that lens, they truly do want um, to benefit. Uh, the organization, and uh, the data that you get around the different perceptions of people. So I just worked with um, a company that has said 
um, they don't want to add um, questions that are um, targeted specifically towards um, women employees. Um, I, I think they're making a mistake, but it's their decision um, to do that. The question is, you know, why do you not want um, to do that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a valid question. Why do you don't want to do that? Now, you were talking about data. One big challenge for company executives is how do I measure the impact of employee engagement initiatives uh, on the bottom line? Right? Uh, yeah, it's kind of fluffy. Or is it just the trends? But I'm not sure that it actually has an impact on on my company's bottom line. How would you address this sort of challenge or bias? So this is really um, the ROI of employee engagement mm -hmm. uh, topic that has become. You know, every, we we all want to quantify everything. I mean, even. I, mean, I have a um, financial background, but even those who don't, it's about impact. It's about how you're using your resources. And so, you know, we get a lot of questions in our executive coaching business. What is the ROI um, of executive coaching? Yeah. So um, there are um, organizations, ours isn't one of them, that there's a lot of marketing companies that will go out um, and look at perception data and how it relates to retention, how it relates to talent acquisition. And I think it's much broader than that. I think that in um, the world that we're living in um, now, the choices that people make, um, consumers make, to use your company, to go um, to eat at your restaurant, to um, buy clothes online from you, Whatever the purchase decision is, um, I believe is being significantly informed by what the perception is um, of your organization um, in the market. And it's just a lot easier to get that. You see the list that I see, you know, top 100 companies for working women, um, top 100 companies for social responsibility. I mean, you even see um, significant law firms or professional services firms um, having a social responsibility um, group. It's because organizations that do business with you, if you're a professional service provider, or people, consumers um, that are buying from you, if it's a retail um, company, you are not going to be, you may not be included, but you're going to be excluded very fast if the public perception of your company is bad. So I think it's still hard to get to the quantification of ROI of employee engagement, but I think it's easy to see how complete disengagement or kind of lower quartile um, engagement leads to a really poor brand perception and it leads to revenue loss. Let's keep going on, on this topic then. We, you mentioned Uber earlier and mm -hmm. we could mention a Fox News or a very well-known Hollywood production company. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so does the public perception of a customer brand have an impact on recruiting? I believe it has an immediate impact when it's a bottom quartile or bottom decile um, company, um, because what what you're hearing is, and, and it's different when it's personality based. And I, a couple of the examples that you know are very public are a very specific individual. It's not right. yeah, it's necessarily not the, company. the yes. company's engagement result or culture more broadly. But you know, I was um, on campus doing mock interviewing at Northwestern about a year ago um, with undergraduates. And um, the undergraduate recruiting um, is um, very much skewed towards these, you know, top companies. Um, what 
the individuals, the young students, or they aren't young, they were, you know, 21-year-old seniors who were interviewing said is when you look at organizations that don't treat their um, employees well um, at, their, at the beginning of their careers, so most of these people, nine out of 10, had already asked another individual who had been hired by the company previously, reached out to them via LinkedIn or reached out to them via the school network to find out what their experience has been as an employee um, of a year or two years. Um, And I asked the Career Resource Center, is this um, common? And they said in the last probably two to five years, um, it's almost universal that individuals are checking with Uh, previous hires um, via this, again, social media um, transparency to find out what the employee experience is. Now, is that enough of a um, palette of experience to judge? Maybe, maybe not. But it's a, it's a shift in the buying behavior. If you are um, an individual that has options or multiple offers in terms of the employee experience. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's a good point. I've I've had a couple of um, guests on the previous episodes on the podcast. Uh, Shonda Zilich, Zilich from, uh, she's the head of uh, global employment brand at GE. And uh, Katie Van Horn, uh, she's the VP of global engagement and inclusion at GoDaddy. And hmm. in, in the case of GE, GE had in the consumer mindset the perception of being a manufacturing company, while now they've migrated fully to be a technology and digital company. But still, in the consumer mindset, or in general public, uh, it, it's still perceived as what well, GE makes appliances. right? And in the case of GoDaddy, everybody has in mind the sort of racy commercials a few years back of what good that he, uh, how good I actually promoted their brands, and they had a huge issue with attracting uh, female workers for the company. And when the new CEO came on board, he literally ditched the the old GoDaddy commercials to really focus on a more genuine uh, brands aspect, as well as uh, you know, changing their recruiting, uh, the employee brand policy and strategy to really be more appealing to female workers. So there's still always there's always a, um, a a challenge or a confrontation between how people perceive a brand as a consumer and whether or not they may want to engage with that brand as an employee. I, uh, agreed, but you've seen um, egregious examples um, such as. Um, where an organization is using, let's say, uh, poor labor practices, um, and there's a backlash um, among um, consumers against their products. Um, You know, we saw this about, I think it's six years ago with Walmart in terms of um, sourcing of um, garment uh, manufacturing. And I think those... um, they stand out um, when it's related to something that's that, um, let's call it egregious or bad. But I think people are more willing to um, look at the gray now about what does this really mean for me um, as an employee if you know uh, people aren't being promoted from within or I don't know what the high potential process looks like um, or... Um, all, you know, 90% of the leaders are, um, let's say, white males who've been in their roles for, you know, more than a decade. What does that mean for me in terms of my opportunity set? You know, just, it's a data point. It, it is, it is. Uh, l- let me go back a little bit to the discussion we had at the beginning around uh, voluntarily and involuntarily tra- transitions. So, on, on, again, on the customer side, individuals crave for a variety of experiences, right? They may not be loyal to a specific brand any longer. They just go to the brand that offers the better or the best 
customer experience. It's no longer so much in terms of who has the lowest price or whatever it might be. It's more about what kind of experience brands provide uh, on the customer side. On the employee side, more and more, especially with the millennials, they also crave for work experiences. They may not stay for a long time with the company, or they will stay until actually they still gain some experience and they may decide to go somewhere else. So how do companies can adapt, how can they adapt to face that challenge of that, uh, res- that search of experiences on the, on the employee side? Um, so um, I think there are some companies that are doing it really, really well um, in terms of the adaptation of um, technology in their um, hiring process or the, the application process, um, gamification, um, and um, the idea of changing scheduling once you are an employee via technology. Um, so there are there are things that companies are doing, um, especially ones that have more resources um, or um, a broader base of employees, so it's you know just more applicable. But when you look at the things that companies aren't doing, so organizations that want um, you have to come to the office every single day, um, and there's um, a formal dress code, and um, there's no communication around around, let's say, um, other opportunities that might be available within that company. When that person goes home or goes to talk to um, his or her friends um, on the weekend, they're more and more likely to see their own um, suboptimal company as being one that, and they're they're much, much more likely to tell people about the suboptimal experience Mm -hmm. than in the past, uh, because they don't see themselves as being um, a company employee. They own their own career, they own their own skills, um, and they're portable. And so I think as we look at what happens, they communicate among each other. And so it's somewhat of a downward spiral. The company that doesn't offer um, flexibility and um, a good employee experience is going to get less and less people overall, just quantity applying. They're going to get a less quality of person, potentially because of the smaller subset and potentially because those who have other options just in self-selection won't come. And so they become at a significant competitive disadvantage if they're in the same industry as the company that offered all of those things. So it's relative value. There's always going to be organizations that have more formality or more structure needed. But among your peer group, if you aren't doing the things that the best-in-class employer is doing, you're going to get um, uh, marginalized by the best-in-class competitor. Yes, I completely agree with you. We're getting close to to the conclusion of uh, this podcast, but let me ask you a few fun questions for uh, so that our listeners get to know you a little a little better. If you were to invite a historical figure to dinner, who would that be and why? So I would invite um, Lord Mountbatten of Burma. Sort of a um, unusual choice, but I am. Um, half Pakistani and half uh, Burmese. And um, my father left uh, Burma as um, a refugee and then um, was resettled um, in the early 40s and then came to um, what was then India um, until the partition in 1947. And so I've always been fascinated by the history of um, the Southeast Asian subcontinent. And even though uh, my father emigrated here in the late 50s, and uh, my mom in the early 60s to the U.S. Um, I still um, very much follow um, the politics um, and history of that region. And so um, that would be my choice. And I would love to have his perspective um, on what the British um, rule in that area and really represented. Um, and my dad's father was part of the judiciary in Burma. 
And so that's the reason I would choose him. Interesting. You've been to many countries. What What is your favorite country? So mm, I would say that I used to love um, to visit Pakistan um, when um, my mother's family, um, when I was a child, my mother's family lived there. Um, because of the sense of um, significant difference versus um, my life in the U.S. Um, but I traveled a lot over the years um, to the U.K. Um, on business, and I think the juxtaposition of a lot of um, cultures mm-hmm. of living in um, a melting pot um, in London, it's probably my favorite city um, to visit, um, and I have a lot of friends there. So. I love the melting pot in London. I completely agree with you on this. So w- when you go on vacation, when you travel, what is the essential item that you always take with you? Okay, because I'm a type A person, I take a ton of reading material, often um, the magazines that I don't have time to read, and then I give them away um, at the pool. Um, and so I t- and I take books because I'm not going to run out of um fun reading material when I'm on holiday. And then I, when I run out of the paper reading material, I read on my um, iPad. Okay. Now, it's funny because we, obviously, I'm French. And (laughs) and BPI is headquartered in Paris, even though you didn't mention that uh, Paris or France was your favorite uh, city or country. Well, I um, now that you mention it, no, I, um, and I actually um, speak French. I was French lit along with um, biology undergrad. So it's it's funny that later in my career I've come to work for this amazing French company, but maybe more than coincidental. <laughs> well, let's stay a little bit on the French topic then. What is your favorite food? And you don't my have favorite? to say French cuisine. No, my favorite food is biryani, which is basically a saffron rice paella. It's um, uh, often made with chicken, and my favorite version of it is the one that I make. So um, that's my favorite food in the world. It's my comfort food. It's my children's comfort food, my husband's. Um, it's kind of complicated to make, but when, um, whenever my children um, came home from um, college or still do, um, that is um, our dinner the first night they get home. Okay, good. Good, good. What is the way for our listeners to follow you and BPI on social media? Oh, um, I absolutely follow me on Twitter. Um, link in with me and send me a note. Um, I don't accept people into my LinkedIn um, who um, you know I haven't met, uh, but follow us at BPI Group. Um, in terms of our LinkedIn and social media um, sites. And you will see a lot of um, original um, work, a lot of our point of view around talent. Um, and um, we, we love um, engaging with people. So send us um, a note. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show, Rahila. I really enjoyed your perspective on the transitions and the place of women in the workplace. I'm sure that many of our listeners enjoyed this conversation as well. It's been a pleasure, Stefan. Thank you so much. Look forward to speaking with you again. Thanks for tuning in to the EX Podcast. If you want to learn more, visit our website at expodcast.com. If you want to find out more about our next conferences, go to exsummit.com. Finally, you can also find my manifesto on business to employee or B2E branding at b2ebranding.co. See you next week.